check, check, check. Good morning and welcome to worship at Grace Lutheran Church here in Santa Maria. It's wonderful to have you streaming from your homes. I hope you're having a wonderfully restful Sunday morning as we prepare for worship. We're in our second week of studying the prophets. We're going to talk about the suffering prophet Job. So much to learn from the prophet Job. And I hope that God blesses you and opens your mind and teaches you to have compassion and reminds you of his greatness through this text. Our worship begins today at the top of page two, the hymn, O Worship the King, number 804. May God bless your worship. Shall sing to thy praise. 
O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be, be to the Father, and, and to the, the Son, Son, and the Holy the Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Ho Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. Oh, come, come let, let, us let us sing to, to the, the Lord. Lord. Let, let us, us make, make a joyful, a joyful noise, noise to the rock of our, of our salvation. salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. And let's make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the and the sheep of his hand. Glory and to the Holy and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it is was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship Him. And now we read responsively hymn number 18. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The rock, my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord, to my God I cried for help. From his temple he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Please be seated for our next hymn. Strong to 
The Old Testament reading is from Job chapter 38. The Lord said to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. You determined its measurements, surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons, sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with the doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds into garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall, we, shall you come and no farther and here shall you, should your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked into the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you knew all of this. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The second readings is from Romans chapter 10. Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the, the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they have not been believed? And how are they to, be, to believe in him of whom they are never heard of? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that he has heard from us? 
So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel today comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had mis dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. O oh, Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory Please be seated. I'm a big podcast listener. I don't know how many hours a week I listen to podcasts, but it's far too much. It's by far one of my favorite sources of information, education, and entertainment. And one of my favorite podcasts had a review of this particular podcaster's last 20 plus years of being online, streaming the different news stories that he publishes through his podcast. And he said when he initially started doing the podcast, again, it's a news-related kind of current events, world events, there's some history in there. He said when he first started doing his podcast, his goal was to lead people to a place of wonder. And if people could have an aha moment or a moment where audibly you could hear them say, oh, wow, then he had succeeded. But after years of telling that story, he started to realize that it was only telling part of the story. And essentially, my word, not his, it tended to lack some compassion. Because a lot of those, oh, wow, kind of moments don't necessarily acknowledge the hard parts of the stories. So he then said, my goal was realigned and I began to see my, my word not his, call as a podcaster to lead people into points and places of struggle. If there was ever a prophet in the Bible, and again, there are a lot of prophets, 
but the one that really gets into the nitty-gritty of the wonder and the struggle of a relationship with God, of being just human in a world full of suffering, it must be the prophet Job. If you don't know anything about Job, let me bring you up to, up to speed. Job is a very wealthy man with everything anybody could ever ask for, obviously ancient world expectations. And he is the unfortunate recipient of suffering that God directly allows. And that's kind of just the introduction to the story. The bulk of the story is Job being inappropriately and incorrectly and heartlessly counseled by his three friends. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their names. The majority of the book of Job is what you could kind of boil down to a really bad counseling session. A confrontation of sorts between Job and his three friends in which they say over and over and over, Job, you're just screwing up. Job, look how bad things are in your life. And the reason that they point to is some kind of mysterious sin in Job's life. So I hope you take at least one thing away from the story of Job, that it has something to say about how we as Christians, as followers of God, counsel and encourage our friends through suffering. Because Job's friends clearly show that they cannot put up with Job's suffering. They want to make sense out of it. They keep saying, Job, if only you had more faith. Job, if only you hadn't screwed up so bad. Job, if you'd only admit the secret sin in your life, then maybe none of this would have happened and maybe it will just stop. Maybe the pain will go away if you just admit to God that you are a sinner who deserves punishment for your sin. And Job says, I can't do it. Now think about that for a minute. minute. This struggle is no different for us now. Because there's always that little voice in the back of our head that says, when I'm suffering, when there's a problem, when somebody else is treating me poorly, or when I am having a bad day, that there's, it's just, it's sin. It's the nastiness of a corrupted flesh, of a corrupted mind, of a corrupted heart, of, of being slaves to sin. And that's why there's so much suffering and struggle in the world. And we just kind of boil the whole thing down. But Job says a different thing. Now, we don't get all of that in this reading, but his constant narrative, his constant dialogue, and why you should go back to Job and read it is, no, I'm not suffering because I screwed up. I'm not even suffering because you screwed up. I'm not suffering because there's all this junk in the world. He says, I'm blameless. It wasn't me who caused all of this. You know, there's a, there's a subtle, insidious subtext in the Christian world that says, if you do the right thing, things work out. And the converse of that that isn't always said is, things aren't working out, are they? wonder why. You know, and it's right for us to look in the mirror and say, okay, yeah, I'm a sinner and in need of forgiveness. I mean, we say it over and over and over, and it becomes this big book that we just smash over each other's heads all the time, and we get so used to it that that voice just keeps going on. That internal dialogue just keeps saying to us, you're suffering right now. You're having a bad day right now. You lost your job. You lost somebody significant in your life. Your marriage has fallen apart. Your children don't like you. Whatever. And you know, it's kind of your fault. Don't put up with that voice. Job, at the very least, proves to us that it's okay to say it is not my fault. I didn't do it. And his friends go on, they wax eloquent for chapter after chapter after chapter of like, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Like, yeah, I have. I've thought about all that, and it's still not my fault. It's still not my fault. People of God, it is not your fault 
that the world sucks. Okay? It is not your fault when other people are nasty to you. It is not your fault when your children treat you like junk. When you lose a job, when your marriage falls apart, when you get sick, when you die, or when people around you die. It is not your fault. If there's no freedom in the gospel, then why preach it? And Job, in his Old Testament way, is so much the gospel because he stands in front of his very lousy but well-intentioned friends and says, no. That's not how this works. You see, Job is being told by his friends that, well, yeah, you know what? You're kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Nice and fluffy on the outside. It's a very biblical metaphor. I'm a sheep. They're like, yeah, but on the inside, you're a wolf. They really want him to be this insidious character that's just dark and dirty on the inside, who's just kind of masking or masquerading and kind of walking around looking all righteous and like, oh, I've suffered so much, but God loves me, and things are so bad, but it's going to be okay in the future. And, and he doesn't actually say any of that, but that's kind of what they keep insinuating. Go to Romans, Romans chapter 10, first line. Moses writes about the righteousness, the rightness before God, that is based on the law. Moses, classic icon, wrote the Ten Commandments, gave the Ten Commandments, all about law. Do this and this will happen, and if it doesn't happen, it's your fault. That the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Do what's right. But, this is Paul's big but, but the righteousness based on faith that's, this, is the, this is the good righteousness, the one that we need, the saving righteousness. Not the one based on the law, where if you trust in doing good things, good things will happen to you. No, new righteousness. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Don't judge others, who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. Or who will descend into the abyss, who's going into hell. But what does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Why does the law fail? Because it will never be in your heart and in your mind. It's always outside of you, and it's always judging you. But the faith that saves us, the one that says, all my friends think I'm to blame, and I can say, no, I'm not, that's the faith that resides inside of you as only a gift of God, and it does not condemn you. It does not choose to select who goes to heaven, and it does not choose to condemn who goes to hell. It says, I don't know about all that, but I'm good with God. And that is not the message of Job's friends. Okay, but sometimes we want to be sheep's, sheep's, sheep in wolves' clothing, right? We want to be tough. You're right. Oh, gosh. If only I confess a little more, if only I pray a little more, if only I act a little more Christian, if only I make a few more right choices. Yeah, I'm a sheep on the inside, and I know it, and you probably know it too, but I'm going to act like a wolf. I'm strong, and I'm tough, and Job doesn't say that either. When his friends say, you know what, if you just did the right thing, Job, God would give you everything that you lost back, your family, your children, your riches, your notoriety in the community, he'd give it all back. Just act like it. Just do the right thing. Just be the person God wants you to be. And he's like, I got nothing. I'm suffering right now. I got nothing to give God and I don't need to give him any, anymore because that's not why this is all happening. So then God speaks in Job 38. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Please understand 36 and 37, chapters 36 and 37 are the last friend just hammering on Job. And then it goes straight from that narrative, that speech, that dialogue, straight into 38. And God says all of this. Tell me if you have understanding of the whole entire earth and its foundations, where it came from. Who determined its measurements? Kind of a funny choice of words. He's not just interested in like, look how great I am. It's like, did you decide what the exact specifications of the horse would be? That the horse 
and the deer would both be four-legged creatures and would run through the forest but would be totally different that every single human that was created, each of them had to have a nose and an ear and an eye and an eyebrow and an eyebrow line and a chin and all of those things had to be measured. (laughs) Who determined its measurements, Job? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstones? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You see the connection there between the cosmic bodies and the human body. And he says, the two glorify one another. They might seem unrelated to you, but they're not to me. Or who shut in the sea with the doors? Did you ever think about that? That there's enough land sitting in the ocean that the ocean isn't constantly just washing over it. I know our seas are rising, but it's taken many, many millennia to get there. Who shut the seas in the door? When I made clouds its garment, (laughs) and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors. You see that? God said, who calibrated this whole machine to allow it to do this, but not that, or to allow it to do this at the right time, and this later, or this now, and this in just a few minutes, all of those measurements of the cosmos. Who did all of that? And he goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Now, question, because it's probably occurring to you, is God doing exactly to Job what his friends just finished doing to him? That big book? Boom, boom, boom. Look how amazing I am, Job. He can hear Job's thoughts and hear his heart. Is God just crushing Job with the final blow? Or is God stepping in and choosing a type of compassion that shuts out the other voices? See, don't forget that all of God's words, his crystal clarity his amazing specificity, his pointing to the connection between the human bodies and the astral bodies, asking Job these grandiose questions as well as these very minute questions. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. But remember, Job is already suffering. See, the connection between wonder and struggle becomes most pronounced when we are crushed. And God knows that with all of that chit-chat going on in the back of our minds and all the bad advice that we get and all of the self-imposed guilt and all of the it's my fault being thrown at us because that's the only thing the world and the law can do. That's the only weapon they have. That's the only righteousness they have is to judge you more than you judge yourself. And he steps in and with his loud cosmic voice says, yeah, but Job... I agree with you. I made all this for you. Don't give in to those petty voices that tell you that this is your fault. You are right, not because of all the things you do, but because of all the things I made you to already be. And you can't take that away from yourself, and nobody can take it away from you. See, Job hears the voice of God the same way that you and I hear the voice of God when struggle has crushed us. And all we can do in that very dark hole where we can't see how wonderful God is, is hope that he opens our eyes and reminds us of the wonder of the universe, that God is near, which is exactly what Romans 8 says, that God is close. The, the readings don't always line up so perfectly. But Matthew 14 is Job's suffering story and our suffering story of going from struggle to wonder with God, of being reminded that it's not our fault, but we still need God to save us because Peter, in his excitement to see Jesus, does something that nobody should do. You shouldn't step out of the boat, Peter. But he does. 
He says, I believe that the power of God is so great that I can do things, I can think things, I can be the person that he wants me to be in this moment, not who everybody else thinks that I should be. That it's not my fault if I drown, but before I take my last breath, I'm going to call out for help, and that's exactly what he does. Job, Peter, you, me, we are struggling but God has not left us and his presence is here pointing to a universe of wonder encapsulated in you. May this word of God guard your hearts and your minds as the world and the law accuses you so often for things that are not your fault. Amen. I invite you to rise as our worship continues at the top of page 7 with our canticle, the Te Deum. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God.
that you will come as our judge that final day. So help your servants, you have redeemed by blood, we pray. May we, with saints be numbered, with praises never end. In glory everlasting, amen, O oh Lord, amen. We would like to thank you once again, as always, for your generous tithes, gifts, and offerings. Our financial world does not become any more certain by the day or the weeks. That's understood. We're all human here. We're all trying to make our way. If you cannot continue to give either in the way that you have been or at all, do what is right for your family, for your callings and your responsibilities. Do that first. We do thank you for prioritizing the church and the ministries that we do. We continue to uh, do ministry despite COVID. Uh, next week, in fact, we are going to have a group worship service outside, right outside the front doors of the church. We welcome anybody to attend. We would love to have you uh, there with us. It's going to be nice, beautiful out there every morning uh, this time of the year. If you can't be there, you don't want to be there for health reasons, you'd prefer to continue to stream online, or you just really like going to worship in your pajamas, please continue to do so. Uh, we will be streaming next week as well. Uh, forgive us for any technology glitches that may happen since we have yet to do this outside, but we're going to do our best. I invite you to rise as we continue with the prayers of the church at the top of page 8. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our prayers of the church today, uh, I will conclude each prayer with, O Lord, hear my prayer, and the congregation will respond with, and let my cry come to you. Please join me as we pray. O Lord, our God, we do not presume to know your ways or inform your judgment. We ask you to grant us your Holy Spirit so that we may apprehend your ways and know your Son, Jesus Christ, by faith. Give us wisdom that we may trust in your word amid the stormy seas of this mortal life and be safely delivered from all danger unto the eternal shores of heaven. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O Lord, our God, we have no righteousness of our own, but only the righteousness of Christ, into which we were clothed in baptism. Grant us grace that we may be faithful in every circumstance and bold in the confession of his saving name. Guard those who preach your word to us, so that hearing we may believe, and believing we may have everlasting life. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O Lord, our God, we see the great need and ask you to raise up those who will serve us as pastors, teachers, missionaries, and in all church work vocations. Bless church planters and the younger congregations that they may endure. Bring hope and renewal to all struggling congregations and to the pastors who serve them. And do not let fear keep us from your word and sacrament. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O Lord, our God, we ask you to bless us, our nation, and those who lead us. Guide all elected and appointed civil servants in their judgments, that we may know justice in our land and peace among the nations. In these weeks, as children are going back to school at all age levels, we ask that you would give our school administrators wisdom, that you would give our teachers and their aides flexibility, adaptability, and that all would overflow with discernment and compassion. 
as we try to make our way through a world that has drastically changed. We ask, God, that you would keep the young minds and spirits of our children, that you would keep their hopes alive as their worlds have changed so dramatically. Please also provide for the daily needs of those who are struggling with childcare, with joblessness, with reduced work hours and reduced pay. Please, God, we know we are in your hand and we ask that you would remind us through your daily provision. Make us especially mindful of those who need our special protection, the unborn, the aged, and the oppressed. O oh Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O oh Lord, our God, we remember the sick, those who suffer, those troubled in mind, the grieving and the dying. We ask that you would be with all those who have been afflicted with COVID-19, all those who are recovering, having successfully come through it, especially all those doctors and nurses, all frontline staff who are caring directly for those who are sick. We ask that you would deliver them according to your will and grant them the comfort of your word in their afflictions, that they may depend on your mercy in every circumstance. We ask especially that you would be with Edith Quaid, Debbie Payne, Ruth Weber, Christy Esparza, Father Charles Shores, Sherry Wilkinson, Steve Hansen, Anne and Roger Rule, the father of Diane Maranaka, John Solorio, Dolores Bradshaw, Jack Smith, Jim Crafts, Roger O'Rourke, Mark Payne, Moira Sandrick, Tammy Earle, Michelle, Mike Kelly, the family of Noelle Schmidt, Diane Williams, Cam Riley, Joyce Chrisman, Marie, Lily Gomez, Sierra Nightingale, Terry Garrity, Karen Hope, Heather Page, Gloria Amaryllis, and Kathy Wildling. Mercy in circumstance, we ask, O Heavenly Father. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. O Lord, our God, we pray for you to be the light in darkness, our strength and weakness, our courage and fear, and our peace in distress. Speak to us by the voices of your word, that we may call upon you in the day of troubles and confess your saving name before all people. Hear us on behalf of ourselves and those for whom we have prayed, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Almighty and most merciful God, preserve us from all harm and danger that we, being ready in both body and soul, may cheerfully accomplish what you want done through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doing being ordained by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of the Lord, of Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Our worship concludes on page nine, Built on the Rock, hymn number 645. And you, as you go about your day, I pray and I hope that the words of Job and the words of God speaking to Job will resonate in your heart and mind and remind you that God loves you, not because of what you do, but because of who he made you to be. Amen. <clears throat>
still are chiming and calling, calling the young and old to rest. But above all the soul's distress, longing for rest everlasting. I leave with you, Father. 